let's just go ahead and uh, have a word of prayer. Lord, Psalm 20, uh, 33 says, For the, the word of the Lord is right, and all his works all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And let all the earth fear him. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing and makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And Lord, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that we have it in our language. That, and we can open it up and, and just uh, be blessed by its content. And Lord, we're thankful for our church family. And Lord, this morning, again, as we always do, we just pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding and help us to grasp what you'd like to teach us today. Lord, in these uncertain times, we pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. And, and Lord, we pray for our, our military people and our law enforcement people. And again, we pray that you'd protect them as they protect us. And Father, again, help us to be appreciative of all that you've done in and through our lives. In Jesus' name. You know, Ephesians is one of the, one of the, I think one of the most significant books in our Bible. And uh, when we were in, in Bible college, that was the one book we had to memorize. We had to, to memorize the book of Ephesians, and it was a tremendous blessing. But um, this morning we're going to kin continue on with our, our study here and the, the key verse of, in the book of Ephesians that we're going to be looking at, Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And, uh, of course, the, the theme of the book is unity, and the key word we're going to find is together. And last uh, time I mentioned that many of our New Testament books have an Old Testament counterpart. And the epistle to uh, Romans has Exodus, Hebrews has Leviticus, and Ephesians has Joshua. And the book of Joshua tells how the Jews um, came into the land of Canaan to take possession of their physical inheritance. And Ephesians, the New Testament counterpart, speaks of no physical inheritance for the church age believer. But Ephesians tells us of our spiritual inheritance. And we find that the children of Israel never took possession of all the land that they were promised. They never possessed their entire inheritance. And God uh, provided all that they needed to accomplish that task, but in spite of the, the promises and the encouragement from, from the Lord, they failed. In Joshua 1 7, it says, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And that, uh, that was that they would prosper in getting their inheritance, taking their inheritance. God uh, promised to be with them in that, his promises to be with him in that day was just as real as his promises to us are now. And the tragedy of the believer today is that, is the same as it was for, for the Israelite. Most believers never take possession of what God has provided for them. And this is uh, one of the things that becomes obvious as we are going to move through the book of Ephesians. I also mentioned last time that Ephesians is divided up into two, two segments. It's divided right down the middle. Chapters 1 through 3 gives us an understanding of who we are in Christ, and chapters 4 through 6 gives us, gives us uh, the outcome of that understanding and how it is to affect our lives. <clears throat> 
Well, we didn't get very far in our, in our first session in the, in the book. Only we got up to chapter, or to verse 7. And Ephesians is not a book that you can rush through, and we're going to find that as we move on. Um, but let's look at um, Ephesians 1.7 before we move into new territory. Whoops. I, somehow, I forgot that, didn't we? Well, anyway, as we move through Ephesians, <laughs> we need to pay special attention to the phrases such as in Christ and in him. Very important phrases. And we're going to find these phrases pop up all the time as we move through there. But let's look, look again at Ephesians 1.7. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And notice uh, that it says in him. And Paul is focusing on what we have in Christ. And in him we have redemption. This isn't a case of someday I hope that I can have it, or I don't know for sure, but I certainly hope that I am acceptable to God. It is a firm declaration that in Him, or in Christ, I've been redeemed. And in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. The apostle says, we were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. And when he, he says this, he is, is emphasizing the fact that God who has created us entered into another altogether separate act. All mankind is God's by creation. As creator, God has a right to do with us whatever he desires because he made us. Redemption is, take, is talking about that the one who, who already possessed us buying us back to himself. Because of the fall of man, every human being is born separated from God. Redemption is that act in which Christ made it possible for us as fallen creatures to be reunited with our Creator. And redemption means that we become doubly His. We're His by creation, and we're His by purchased redemption. And, that re and the redemption that uh, we have is through His blood. And in Hebrews 9.12 it says, with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He poured out his life blood for us in the form, or, or his life for us in the form of his blood on the cross. And the, in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our salvation is not of ourselves. God is both the author and the finisher of it. So look again at Ephesians 1.7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We have been redeemed. And we have been forgiven. And now we have total access to God. Not because we deserve it, but simply because God in eternity past purposed in his heart to extend grace to his fallen creation. Our salvation is not something we work for. It's not something that we someday hope to obtain. If we, if we have placed our faith and trust in the finished work of Christ, it's already ours. And Paul understood from the beginning that, that this was the message that had been given to him by God. He understood that he was to preach of God's forgiveness and the inheritance made available to all who believe. Now last week we looked at, uh, at what Jesus told Paul at the time of his conversion on the Damascus Road. And if you look at Acts 
26, 17 through 18, it says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. As individuals who have put their faith in Christ, you and I stand before God redeemed and forgiven with an inheritance. And that inheritance is not just a promise of eternity with God after we die. Our inheritance in in Christ begins the second we accept him as Savior. Let's look again at Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. We are accepted on the basis of what Christ has done for us. And when it says we have forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, this doesn't mean that, uh, that the Lord just puts up with us. I mentioned this last time. It's not that God is obligated by what Christ did on the cross to tolerate our, our presence. We are accepted, embraced, given an inheritance, and welcomed into the family. Now look now at, at Ephesians 1, 7, and 8 together. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Well, what does it mean that his grace he made to abound toward us? Well, I mentioned last week that many Bible teachers struggle with grace and see it as an unhealthy focus. Yet if if you read the epistles of Paul, you better get used to grace Because that's his message. And look at what he says here. This grace is not rationed out a little at a time. It's lavished on us. Let's look at Ephesians uh, 7 and 8 through the New, New American Standard Version. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us with all wisdom and insight so the riches of his grace is lavished upon us it's difficult to understand why some some bible teachers struggle with this concept because this is paul's message I want you to picture in your mind a little child walking on the, along the beach with a, a little plastic bucket in her hand. And is there enough water in the ocean to fill that child's bucket? Well, in the same way, God has enough grace to fill your need. And in regard to his grace, God does not deal with us from a position of want, but from a position of abundance. And now, as I mentioned before, there are those who feel that this teaching on grace creates a lax form of Christian living. If that's the case, why would Christ lavish upon us, lavish it upon us in all wisdom and insight? Grace is not something that hinders spiritual growth, but it enhances it. This is why God in his wisdom has it abound toward us. Now, now let me share with you a story that I think explains God's grace. The setting is a Roman slave market. With many slaves, both male and female, old and young, that have been brought there to be sold. There's a beautiful young woman who is to be auctioned off with the rest. And these slaves are waiting in line to be sold to the highest bidder. And uh, the time came for this young woman to be placed on the auction block. And one of the men who starts bidding for her is a well-known landowner who is extremely vile and cruel. 
And every time this woman looks at this man who is attempting to buy her, she shudders visibly. But there's another gentleman, an older gentleman, in the very back of the crowd that he starts bidding also. And every time this landowner increases his bid, this older gentleman in the back, he raises it by one dollar. And finally the landowner just gives up. And the older gentleman went and paid for this young woman. And immediately after purchasing her, he wrote out a paper of manumission, giving her her freedom. And when he handed her the paper, she realized what it was. And she was so overcome. She fell on her knees before him and she said, I will serve you forever. And he said, well, you don't, you don't understand. You're free. I release you. And she repeated the second time, but... I will serve you forever. And he said, I don't want to be your owner. I want to be your father. This is a picture of grace. The only difference is most people don't see that they are already a slave to a vile and cruel owner. In God's grace, we as believers have been set free. But more than that, We've been adopted into his family. All too often, we've not completely realized the, the hopelessness and helplessness we are at in our lost condition. So we fail to understand the full extent of the freedom that we have. We must come to see that our salvation is much more than, than just going, uh, not going to hell. Ephesians 1 6 says to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved When we come to recognize what God's grace has provided for us when we come to realize the extent of our salvation We fall on our knees before God and exclaim I will serve you forever this is why God makes grace abound toward us with all wisdom and prudence. Now let's look at Galatians, or Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And let's take a good look at the highlighted phrase here. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. Now we could stop right here for a while and we could go around a room and I could ask each of you, what do you think the mystery of God's will is? And no doubt we would uh, have uh, about as many answers as there are people in the room, but many people live their lives thinking that God's will is very difficult to figure out. And I used to be amazed when we were, uh, we were at the Mission Training Center, how many of our students, and these were all Bible college graduates, would come into the, to the training center and fret and worry about finding God's will in regard to what country they were to go and serve in. And the mission at that time worked in 27 different countries. They all wanted desperately to serve God. But they were all worried about missing His will by going to the wrong country. And I, I, I couldn't figure it out. I said, well, are you worried you're going to lead the wrong people to Christ? M many people see something mystical about God's will when there's nothing mystical at all. I'd often tell these students who were, were struggling in this way, well, look at James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally without reproach, 
and it will be given to him. I don't know if you've ever done that. I've done it on several occasions. I'll tell you one thing you figure out right away when you pray for wisdom. You don't feel any wiser. You get on your knees and you pray for wisdom and you get up feeling just as dumb as before you bow down. But God doesn't say he's going to make you feel wise. He says, I'm going to give you wisdom. And so I tell them, I say, after you do this, if you're not sure what country to go to, get on your knees and ask the Lord and then get up and make a decision. When Janet and I decided to go to Indonesia, we didn't even know where the country was. We had to get a map out and figure out where the place was. Because we were not sure where to go either, but we looked at the needs. And that's what I told them. Look at what the needs are in the field and then make a decision. Indonesia had 300 language groups and just a handful of missionaries. So, um, but the key element is to move. You know, Will Rogers said, uh, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. And that's, that's, there's a lot of truth to that. You got to move. And finding God's will should never be difficult for the believer. Often people struggling with God's will struggle because they already know what his will is for them. They just don't want to do it. But let's move on. Ephesians 1, 9 through 10, it says, Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So he says, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Now Paul is saying here that the mystery of his will has already been made known to each of us. And this, there's, so there's nothing mystical here. And notice that he made it, has made this known to us according to his good pleasure. Finding God's will in our lives is not difficult because communication is a choice that God made in our behalf. God doesn't have to communicate with us. He's not obligated to let us in on what his will is. But he chooses to do so, and this is the mark of a relationship, the relationship that he desires to have with each one of us. Notice what Jesus told his disciples in John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now, it's, it's important for us to understand that when the Bible is talking about a mystery, it's not talking about some, something unsolvable like a crime. The word mystery in, in our Bibles, it refers to something that has not been previously revealed. So when, when Paul uses the word mystery in his writings, Pay close attention because he is saying that this information was not previously known. An example of this is uh, Colossians 1, 24 through 27. And this is one of my favorite examples. I, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the, the stewardship from God which was given to me for you. To fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So when Paul mentions mystery, pay attention to what he's saying. Every time he does, he's in the process of telling the believer something that was previously hidden or unknown. 
And notice, notice what he says about this. Just look at this. The mystery which has been hidden from the ages, but now has been revealed to his saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now this was something new to the Colossian believers. And when we couple this with what we've been studying in Ephesians about being in Christ, what a tremendous promise. We're not only in Christ, but he is in us. How is it then that so many believers live their lives from day to day without even considering Christ in their decision-making process? No wonder so many of us are like, live like spiritual paupers. But our, our point in, in going to these verses in Colossians is that when Paul speaks of a mystery in Scripture, he's referring to God revealing something which was previously concealed. So whenever you see that word mystery, go back and look at it. Go back and look and say, okay, what is Paul wanting me to see that was not known by believers in the Old Testament or before? And this is consistent with uh, the new relationship that Jesus spoke about with his disciples. In John 15, 15 again, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I've made known to you. Well, let, let's uh, move on. Look again at Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. I, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And let's look at this highlighted phrase, in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now this is referring to a time when all things will be brought under the rule of Christ. And this is looking forward to when Jesus comes again. And at that time, all the rulers and authorities of this world will, be, will subject themselves to him. There will be no hunger, no pain, no injustice any longer. This is when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And this will be a great day for you and I as children of the King. And notice that everything will be brought together in him. And in Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, it says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And notice again these two, two little words, in him. It is in him or in Christ before whom one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, that he is Lord. And it is in him that we ob have obtained an inheritance. And again, this is past tense, not future tense. The inheritance is already ours. It's ours because we were being predestined, we're being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Keep in mind that predestination is God's predetermining not where I will be, but what I will be. God has already predetermined what you're going to be. In Ephesians 1.5 it says, having predestined us to adoption as sons. And of course, and I mentioned this many times, it says sons here not because God is so hung up on men. It says sons because... A son was one who could inherit. So it has been, we have been predestined to us, he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. God predetermined that everyone who accepts Christ will be adopted as part of his family. And then Ephesians 1.11 says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So, so God predestined every believer, every son, every 
or, or every child of God to have an inheritance. And in Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we see from these verses that God has predetermined that every person who accepts Christ will be adopted as his child. Every child will have an inheritance and be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay, in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. In him... You also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Up to now, Paul has been, been talking about our inheritance in him. But we would have nothing if we hadn't first placed our trust in him. Well, what does it mean to place our trust in Christ? The New Testament uh, presents the the Lord Jesus as the object of saving faith. So our, our salvation is in, in Him. And as we have seen earlier, our salvation is totally from God. God is the author and finisher of our faith. But Jesus invited people to come to Him, to follow Him, to trust in Him, and obey Him. In, a, in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him, should not perish but have everlasting life. And in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. So Jesus makes the, off, the, author of, the offer of salvation to all who believe in him. And those who are looking for some works by which they might please God, need to, need to focus on John 6, 28 and 29. And then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Okay, this is what Jesus wants of you. What work does he want from you? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Pretty simple, isn't it? The object of our faith is Jesus Christ. Salvation is a result of placing our faith in the finished work that he did on the cross of Calvary when he took upon himself the sins of mankind. At that time, he died a substitutionary death so that all who believe in him will be saved. He was buried. He lay dead for three days in the grave. That proved he was dead. And on the third day, he rose from the grave and was seen by over 500 people. And when he, we accept this provision of salvation, which was made for us by God himself, we have eternal life. Look again at uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So once we have placed our faith in Christ, we become children of God. At that moment, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit as he comes and indwells us. And the Spirit is our guarantee of our inheritance. And to make sure that we can, can obtain all that God promises us, we are given the Holy Spirit who teaches us and guides us into all truth. The thing I'd like you to walk away from this mor with this morning is the, the realization is as you come to know more of Jesus Christ, as you walk more with him, as you come to understand more of that abundant grace, 
You can't help but want to serve him. You can't help but want to, to be more involved with him. I'm not saying more involved with the church or you, know, you want to give more money or whatever. You just want to know more about your Savior. You know, Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Did Paul know the Lord? Absolutely. But that's what the Christian life is all about. The Christian life isn't doing. The Christian life is being. The Christian life is not doing a bunch of good deeds. The Christian life is being a child of God. He doesn't want you to go out and be doing the life. He wants you being his child. And I think it's an important thing to, to understand. Well, this is Communion Sunday.